Hello, everyone. Welcome to our eighth Get to Know Your Forest uh, webinar. My name is Sarah Corcoran. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the coordinator for Save Pennsylvania's Forest Coalition, which is the uh, organization that has been putting on these webinars. Um, my other hat is as the Conservation Program Manager and Interim Deputy Director of the Sierra Club Pennsylvania chapter. So if you have any Sierra Club related questions that you have for me after this, you can uh, reach out, please do. Um, our forester for this program is from William Penn State Forest in southeastern Pennsylvania. And I'm very excited to hear more about this uh, Forest District 17. We do have closed captioning enabled. So if you would like to enable that, you can look at the little live transcript CC button at the bottom of your screen and enable that. Um, we will be recording today. So please a gentle reminder to stay off camera and stay muted for the duration of this presentation. And at the end, we will have about 15 minutes available for Q and A. Um, I just ask that you write any questions you have in the chat and I will read them off at the end of the presentation. So we don't have to worry about folks coming on and off mute. Um, you can put questions in the chat at any time during the presentation and I'll make sure that they are answered at the end. Uh, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Kayla and let her introduce herself and uh, talk more about Forest District 17. Okay, all right. Um, so my name is Kayla Karras. I am a service forester, recreation forester, and urban forester in District 17, William Penn State Forest. Uh, William Penn covers southeastern nine counties, so Northampton, Lehigh, Berks, Lancaster, Chester, Delaware, Philadelphia, Montgomery, and Bucks. So I am one of three service foresters. We also have two fire foresters, and that is our entire staff. <laughs> We're pretty small district, large districts, uh, small staff. So um, yeah, um, apologize for the lighting. You can kind of see me. I've got really big windows behind me that can't really get the good best lighting, but I'm also not complaining because I have really big windows. So it's really nice. So uh, just to start off, um, William Penn State Forest, uh, covers about 2,300 acres here in the Southeast. Um, and I say about because we're growing <laughs> considerably very quickly. So um, we share our office with uh, French Creek State Park. So our office is located within French Creek State Park. Um, and you can see on the, the picture of the building, it says French Creek State Park and Forest District 17. We don't really have a big enough tract of land to really have our own office. And it's just convenient to be centrally located within our district. So I always like to give like a kind of brief overview of our Pennsylvania State Forest. Um, so there's 2.2 million acres of state owned land within Pennsylvania. Um, and you can see, I kind of overlaid the maps together where it shows this distribution of forested land, not necessarily state forest, but forested land in Pennsylvania. And I overlaid it with the state forest. So you can see William Penn in the Southeast, there's a lot of white showing through, and that's because it's one of the, it's the most urban area in Pennsylvania. So we don't have too many forests to work with. Um, Pennsylvania is about 29 million acres and only 17 million of that is forested. So a little over half of Pennsylvania is forested and 93% of it is rural lands, water fields, and then 7% is urban like cities, towns, roadways. So most of that is located within the William Penn State Forest. We have the most populated counties in the state. So it can make my job a little difficult. I'm a forester. There's not too many forests to work with down here. So our district is pretty different from the rest of the state. If you can see, it's difficult to see, but see the green kind of showing through. So William Penn State Forest at a glance, um, you can see our uh, geophysical or physiogeographic re regions kind of, you know, side by side of what our district covers. We have a broad variety of um, different soils and geological features, and it makes our district very different from top to bottom. Um, we have the Schuylkill Highlands. 
um, conservation landscape. So our Schuylkill Highlands conservation landscape is one of the key factors in how we acquire our land. Um, they try to protect a lot of the regions and all the geographic features within the southeast of PA and any forested lands that we have that may be up for sale for development. We really work closely with them, the Natural Lands Trust and local conservancies to try to protect as much land down here as possible. So kind of gives an overview of how different William Penn is and how small we are compared to all the other districts that have hundreds of thousands of acres. So we really focus on uh, kind of like land grabbing in a way down here to prevent um, further fragmentation and expansion from Philadelphia because our forests are being drastically reduced down here. So the history of William Penn, it was formerly the Valley Forge State Forest, but in 2007, the forest district was renamed the William Penn State Forest. And that was due to the public being confused between Valley Forge National Park and Valley Forge State Forest. So our office was actually headquartered at a state park within Valley Forge State, Valley Forge National Forest um, in, in 1976. And then the facility became a federal park. So we moved out of Valley Forge and we kept the state forest name of Valley Forge State Forest for 31 years but the confusion became greater and greater. So in, yeah, about 2007, they decided to rename Valley Forge State Forest into William Penn State Forest to kind of honor Pennsylvania's first real conservationist, William Penn. So the first purchase within uh, William Penn State Forest was in January of 1935, and it was 10 acres in Lancaster County near the Lebanon County line, and it was purchased from the Cornwall estate for a dollar. So 10 acres in 1935 was bought for a dollar, which if anybody lives in the Southeast, you know how much an acre of land goes for, let alone 10. So it's crazy how times have changed. Um, the site then contained the Cornwall Fire Tower, which was erected in 1923. The fire tower has since been taken down with the eventual goal of rebuilding it at the Pennsylvania Forest Fire Museum in Fayetteville. So it was almost 48 years until our next purchase. So for a very long time, Valley Forge State Forest, now William Penn State Forest only had that 10 acres at Cornwall. So like I said earlier, um, we include the nine Southeastern counties and we have about 22, 2300 acres. It's continually changing. Um, across 11 tracts of land. So we have our Goat Hill Natural Plant Sanctuary in Chester County, Honeybrook in Chester, Buck Hollow in Chester, Gibraltar Hill in Berks, Vital Hill in Berks, George W. Wirtz in Berks, Bruce Zimmerman Natural Area in Berks, David R. Johnson in Bucks, Hopewell in Chester, Cornwall in Lancaster, and then Little Tinicum Island in the Delaware River. So our first purchase was a dollar in 1935, and then we added Little Tinicum Island in 1982 in the Delaware River in Delaware County. So we acquired it to preserve its unique ecology, but it's unique to Pennsylvania. It has tidal mudflats. So Little Tinicum Island is 200 acres on low tide and high tide it's 80 acres. So in the very next month in December of 1982, we acquired another unique ecological site, and that was the Goat Hill Serpentine Barrens, and it was 602 acres of approximately 1,000 acres of barrens in southern Chester County, and it was purchased from the Nature Conservancy, purchased with the assistance of the Nature Conservancy, and for quite a long time, there were no other acquisitions. We picked up David R. Johnson, but none of us can remember the date, and that's something else that kind of happens in the William Penn State Forest has a high rate of turnover between employees, um, which is not a bad thing. It's just most foresters like more traditional forestry, like big woods out in the woods marking timber. Um, and the William Penn's much different. We are more of an education slash service um, district. So a lot of turnover, but we got David R. Johnson as a donation. Um, we do have Ruth Zimmerman and Johnson were donations from landowners who didn't know what to do with their property. 
after they passed. So they decided to put it in as a donation to the state to preserve their wooded areas. Um, but in 2015, we began this like big era of expansion. So we partner with local conservation agencies like the Schuylkill Highlands and the Nature Conservancy, um, Berks County Conservancy, Brandywine Conservancy, all the little ones around. Um, and to acquire new tracts of land. So in 2015, I think we added 634 acres. And then in 2016, we had Buck Hollow and another 45 acres close to our Wirtz tract in 2017. So with these new lands, it helps like enable us to further DCNR Bureau of Forestry's mission to provide recreational opportunities and to conserve forests for Pennsylvania. Um, so since our state forest is like really small, I'm just going to review like each of our 11 tracks and like kind of tell you what we have to offer because we're so like widespread. So I think it's nice to just know what each track that we have available is. So I'm going to start with Little Tinicum Island. It is right below build out the airport. So when you're on the island, you've got planes taking off and flying over you. It can be accessed only from Governor Prince Park boat launch. Um, you have to be very careful when you take the boat out because you have to make sure you're watching the tides because your boat can get stranded with low tide. Um, we've had that happen. <laughs> and the mud flats, uh, they will suck you right in. We have one mile of a primitive trail and we have one campsite. Um, we do go down to the island a couple times a year. We used to do uh, garbage pickup days. Um, since the island is in the Delaware River, you can only imagine the amount of garbage that tends to land on the island. But with COVID, we haven't been able to. We usually work with Deloitte. Um, it's a company in Philadelphia, and they like to do an outdoor day with their employees. But with COVID, we are unable to, so we hope to start that again soon. But the picture that you see is part of the northern part of the island where the trail is that doesn't seem to collect the garbage. The garbage usually collects further down with the way of the river. Also, it is an active river with barges. So if, if people call and want to know more about the island, we do warn them that you're traveling into a shipping lane to get to the island. So be very careful of that because they do throw big waves. Um, the island exhibits a good example of a tidal mudflat. Uh, its dominant forest species are riparian trees like willow, sycamore, silver maple, cottonwood, box elder, river birch, and her base of species, pickerel weed, wild rice, which is rare, and we're actually rehabilitating a little lagoon within the island from the invasive Phragmites to wild rice, which is really good. We're seeing really good results with eliminating the Phragmites and getting wild rice, which is a, a rare plant for the area. Um, and things like uh, water hemp and a lot of poison ivy. Uh, common shrubs are sumac, um, alder, and blackberry. And it's got a, it's very adversely affected by non native trees, vines, shrubs, uh, tree of heaven. There's spotted lanternfly on the island, <laughs> um, and honeysuckle, all the typical invasive species. So it's a really good spot. Um, it's got, Wetland species of plants and animals that aren't really commonly found in Pennsylvania, and it's a good place to observe waterfowl and unique plants. We had a heron rookery on the site, but they had since moved. Uh, red tail hawks, great horned owls, and it's really good for migrating species of ducks. Uh, and when, if you're visiting Tinicum Island, there are no structures for docking because of how drastic the tides come and go. And it can make it difficult for watercrafts because of that and the shallow mud flats. So we would just like to give a warning to people that, you know, being an experienced boater or kayaker is a good idea um, to get to the island. Uh, and primitive camping is permitted, but bug nets and bug spray is also highly recommended. And with Tinicum Island, there's some unique history to it. Uh, the island appears on a Swedish map of the Delaware River from the 1650s. And we're not really sure. We don't really see any signs of like people that were living on the island just because it's an island that comes and goes with flooding and it has moved drastically. But they also made the island bigger by dredging the Delaware River for shipping lanes. And there are dredge pipes on the island that are visible at low tide. Um, so it's, it's really unique. It's on maps and we think that it may have been used by the Dutch and the Swedish 
and during the different wars in the area for like a, a blockade. So it's a pretty neat island. So next up on the list uh, is the Goat Hill Wild Plant Sanctuary. So our Goat Hill Serpentine Barrens is a 602 acre designated wild plant sanctuary located in the southwest corner of uh, Chester County and kind of spills into Maryland County. The Mason Dixon line is the property line um, and also the delineator between Pennsylvania and Maryland. And there are Mason Dixon line markers on our boundary line, which is really cool. Uh, the Serpentine Barrens are not common in Pennsylvania, nor is it common in the world. This is a globally rare ecosystem. So it's super unique in how it grows and how it looks down there. And it has unique soils due to the high levels of magnesium and heavy metals in the soil, especially chromium and nickel. Um, Goat Hill was once mined for magnesite and chromite, and you can see a lot of small quarries and filled in mine shafts on the area. And the serpentine soils greatly influence plant life on the site. And there's, it's home to unusual threatened and endangered species and globally rare species. So we have like the serpentine aster, fame flower, lots of different butterflies. And you can see the serpentine bedrock outcrops, which are like laced with like green rock. It's pretty cool. Um, it has a rich and lengthy history. Uh, down at Goat Hill, I'm currently expanding a lot of the trails. So for most of William Penn State Forest history up until basically 2019 when I started, they just didn't really have enough land to really de designate to hiking. So when I started my position in 2019, we acquired more land and I'm the recreation forester. So we started expanding. So we went to about three and a half miles of trails upwards to like 14 miles now. And Goat Hill is one of those expansions. You can see in the red on the map, that's the original trail, the Rose Trail. And we have acquired pieces from Natural Lands Trust and um, the Nature Conservancy to add more to Goat Hill. And with that has come all the trails that are in green. And I'm currently working on building more trails down there and adding campsites. So Goat Hill um, will have much more expansion to it as far as recreation. So we can like share this globally rare ecosystem with everybody. Um, a lot of the rare and endangered plants obviously won't be marked because they're rare and endangered, but it's just an entirely unique ecosystem. And it's it's pretty neat. Um, we do have issues with Southern pine beetle, which is an invasive pest moving its way north. So there are a lot of timber sales that will be going on. And also to facilitate all of the um, endangered species of plants, we do controlled burns to kind of remove the duff layer and help the seed germinate. And we've had really good luck with it, especially with our savanna grasses that only grow in these barren type areas and things like fame flower and very hairy chickweed. So it's pretty neat. Like I said, it has a very lengthy history dating back all the way to uh, the Susquehannock Indians. And from then on, um, William Penn also delineated 500 acre plots to kind of hand out to lords and governors and things like that. Um, lots of wars were kind of fought over the area. I have like a huge long list of highlighted things I wanted to hit. So in 1827, they discovered chromite in Goat Hill. And then in 1828, they opened a wood mine, the wood mine, which was the deepest and largest producing chromite mine in the region. 1830s, placer mining for chromite sand began and lasted until 1860. And then in 1918, they found more chromate that could be mined. So uh, that's kind of the chromite history. And then 1835, they discovered magnesite and they opened a mine down there. And it was one of the most important magnesite mines in the United States. And it operated under um, a man named Isaac Tyson until 1850. And then it transferred to Powers and Waitman of Philadelphia from 1854 to 1871. And it produced most of the country's magnesite at the time. 1850s, um, the state line district, which would have been you know, the state line between Maryland and Pennsylvania was the world's leading producer of chromite ore. 
And then in 1871, the magnesite mine closed down. 1819 or 1918, the need for chromite spiked again because of World War I. So they reopened a bunch of the mines between the 1918 to the early 1940s. And then they kind of wanted to open a big quarry. Basically, long story short, the neighbors did not want a quarry. It got a lot of press within the newspapers and the Philadelphia Inquirer. And then the talks, dis discussions came about to basically find a way for DCNR to acquire the land. And TNC kind of pitched in. And now we have the Goat Hill Natural Area, and we've added to it since. So pretty cool. Um, has a lot of rich history, and it played a really important part during World War I for chromite. So. I highly recommend if you've never been to it, it's just a really neat area and definitely adding more trails and more campsites. So it's pretty cool. Next, we have our Gibraltar Hill Tract, which is located off of 724 uh, in Gibraltar. So we have two parking lots. So two ways of accessing it on the Killian Drive side, which is the 724 side and also off of Ridgeway Road. 269 acres and right now it has about 3.7 miles of trail one primitive campsite but there are more planned so the track was acquired in 2015 through a partnership with the natural lands trust and it's got like an abundance of marked and unmarked trails because there have been numerous timber sales on the property at one point Many, many years ago, it had super high quality timber, but before we acquired the property, which is pretty common down here, it was high graded, meaning they only took like the best timber repeatedly year after year. So it's been quite a venture trying to rehabilitate it and get rid of the invasive species and try to get more of you know, those prime species to grow, especially since that's a higher point in the area. Um, we want to try to get more oak chestnut oak, red oak, and then the bottom is predominantly tulip poplar and ash, which most of the ash has since been removed since we acquired it because of the emerald ash borer. And it does give really awesome views of Berks County from the top of the mountain. So we have our George W. Wirtz complex, which is located right outside of Wernersville. It was Another addition in 2015, it's 479 acres now, we've added to it, and it was formerly the watershed for the Wernersville State Hospital. Um, this also has a very unique history. Um, its namesake, George Wirtz, was the local mill and farm owner who lived at the bottom of the mountain. And it was through his advocacy that the state hospital below was constructed in Wernersville. And through his guidance, like the hospital later procured the property to protect its clean water and forest resources, because that was believed back then, um, 1900s, late 1800s, 1900s, that that would help um, the patients at the hospital. So it is um, a hospital for, um, state hospital for mental issues, um, things like that. I really probably not the right way to say that, but I'm kind of blanking on like how to explain what kind of hospital it is. And it's still there. Um, I think it's one of the only state hospitals of that nature right now. I think they've closed a few other ones, but it's in a really unique and beautiful area. It sits right at the base of the mountain. And uh, they were kind of trying to put off some assets that weren't being used for the state hospital because it is a government run facility. And it was decided that the land just as easy as a signature was transferred to DCNR since it was within the state already. So we have trails over there now, um, three parking areas. We have Sportsman Road, Hunsinger Road, and Texter Mountain. The goal is to eventually acquire the properties within the middle to connect it and make it one large tract because the owners who have the private land between, which I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, um, whoops, between right here have been interested in selling their property because they are older. So hopefully one day we would like to connect all of this together and really conserve that part of the mountain. Um, you'll find mature red oak, beech, sassafras, tulip poplar, uh, white pine, pawpaw, which is getting in the pawpaw season. If anybody's ever had pawpaw before, it's delicious. Uh, we have about 5.6 miles of trails one primitive campsite, but there will be more. Some of the trails are still a work in progress. 
So like I said, we've really added a lot of trails and I am the only recreation forester, so it's a lot. Um, we have our student conservation corps who helps us build trails, which is a lifesaver for me. Um, they constructed a lot of the trails that we have, um, basically connectors. So most of our properties have been logged in the past. So I tend to use logging roads as trails and then the Student Conservation Corps has really helped bridge trails together. And you can see in the picture, the primitive campsite that we put in at uh, the top of the road. We do not have signs or trail, we have trail markers. So you can see the yellow blazes, but we do not have trailhead signs yet. They still have to be made. So we're working all that. It's a very slow process when you only have three foresters for nine counties. So Buck Hollow is located in Chester County. Um, not too much history of this. A developer had the property and was unable to commercialize it due to like legal issues. Wanted to build a giant uh, housing complex and it did not work out. So I decided to unload the property and we acquired it. It was originally 80 acres. I do believe now it's 150, 300. I'd have to second guess because I forgot to write it down. And sometimes I forget. Um, it's quite a big property, has two parking areas, Hay Creek Road and Buck Hollow Road. Right now it has 1.4 miles of trails, but what makes this unique is the Horseshoe Trail which is a 160 mile long trail is partially located on our Buck Hollow tract. And there are only three public primitive campsites along the entire Horseshoe Trail and they're all found at our Buck Hollow site. So out of 160 miles, there's three campsites within 1.4 miles. So um, they do get used. Two of one is already in, two are in, but still need some work. So we have seen use the one that's been in for quite a while, gets heavy use. So very privileged to be able to work with the Horseshoe Trail Conservancy to build these trails and to maintain them and to have the ability for people to camp and really enjoy the whole 160 miles. So really help is, it's a really beautiful tract. And you, the amazed how many trail runners I see on the trail too, compared to all of our other sites. Next up is Honeybrook. Uh, this is one of our newer acquisitions. If you're familiar with the Honeybrook area, it used to be the All Seasons Campground. So as of right now, it's technically open to the public, but we're not advertising it. The trails need re, uh, rehabilitated. Um, there's also a lot of structures on site that still need removed. There's a, asbestos issues, so there's a lot of issues before the buildings can be removed that need to be taken care of. But we, it is open to the public. We have very, very limited parking until we get those issues taken care of. But we wanted to get it and acquire it, and then we've been working on it since. So we also have a 10-acre fenced-in area in the field that's off of Route 10, and that's planted with different uh, cultivars of elm for our for seed source for our in-house DCNR nursery. And the dominant species there are tulip poplar, red maple, and beech. It's a very massive amount of tulip poplar. If you look in aerial photos from like the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, most of the area within Berks and Chester County were farm fields. Uh, and then they changed over into forested areas. Generally, like as men went off to war and came back, they kind of gave, they gave up the farming and started working more in the industrial area. So tulip poplar is one of the predominant species across all of our tracks because it likes full sun and it grows really well in the area. Eventually, uh, Honeybrook will be open for mountain biking, horseback riding, and hiking. Most of our, almost all of our trails right now are hiking only, except for what's on Buck Hollow, which is also horses. And we will be working, which I forgot to even mention, in our George W. Wirtz tract in Berks County. It borders uh, the Robazonia Water Authority. And I'm working with a gentleman there to build connector trails that go from our property down onto the Water Authority property, which will be open for mountain biking. So we're really trying to expand our trail systems to surrounding areas as well to kind of have connectors. 
Our next acquisition is one of our newest ones. It's Seidel Hill. It's the mountain directly next to Gibraltar. So Seidel Hill has a very long, narrow right of way, but it's still under negotiation between the surrounding property areas on how we're going to mark it out to make it open to the public. Technically, all state forest is open to the public, but right now we just don't have a solid right of way to the property and we're working on that. But it was another one of those where the big piece of mountain came up. There was talks of developers buying it and with the Birch Conservancy and the Natural Lands Trust and Schuylkill Highlands, um, we kind of put in a bid for it and was able to purchase the property to keep the Gibraltar Mountain um, a natural forested area. Our second donation property is the Ruth Zimmerman Natural Area. It is located in Ole in Berks County. Uh, it's a natural area, has no trails. It is accessible for hunting and it's a large majority of where our emerald ash borer treatments occur. It is a swamp. It can get pretty nasty there in the summer. I mean, it's beautiful, swampy, uh, skunk cabbage everywhere, lots of amphibians, but the mosquitoes are pretty intense. Uh, it has ash, hickory, red maple, beech, and in some of the higher areas, uh, more rocky areas, it has uh, oak. So lots of amphibians, salamanders, frogs, a lot of songbirds. We do have a really robust population of pileated woodpeckers. They are very territorial and they will fly down at you. I found that out while I was doing emerald ash borer treatments, but they are really fun to listen to and watch. Our first donation is the David R. Johnson Air Natural Area. This is located right along the Delaware River, right up from New Hope. Uh, well, it's up from the Delaware River. Uh, it was facilitated between a surveyor who worked for DCNR and uh, the David Johnson family. So the property had been in the Johnson family since 1876. And now with the donation, they wanted to keep it a natural area and forested. It was donated to the Bureau of Forestry. We treat white ash here too. And the area is prone to extremely heavy flooding. Actually the road, which I think is 32 was closed down for a very long time after flooding last year. And we really couldn't get access to it, but the bridge was rebuilt. So uh, no campsites, no hiking trails, but you can still, the same with Zimmerman, feel free to walk around the property and check it out. It also has our only population of Mount Laurel and Rhododendron on our state forest, which if you know anything about Mount Laurel and Rhododendron, they're more of a Northern species. So it's really cool that we at least have a small piece of property uh, that has Mount Laurel and Rhododendron, and this is 56 acres total. And last, we have our Hopewell site. So Hopewell is surrounded by French Creek State Park. It's up from Scotts Run Lake, and it's where our off our maintenance building is when we store all of our equipment, and it also has the McClintic Marshall Fire Tower and a cabin. So it's got a little historical uh, significance there. Um, the cabin was built the same time as the fire tower to house the fire tower, the wardens and the lookouts. And it was used up until the nineties. And on a windy day, when you're on top of the fire tower, which is on the very top of the mountain here in French Creek, it's, it's a little uh, wobbly. Those guys were pretty brave to stay up in there all the time. So it was pretty cool. So, now that I've kind of like went over all of our tracks, I did not put anything up for Cornwall because it's basically kind of just a 10 acre piece of property that's got an inholding for some towers and stuff. I've personally never even been there, but it's significant because I was, was it was our first purchase. It was what started the William Penn State Forest. We just don't really do much with it there, but it's very significant in the history of the William Penn. So, you know, what makes us so unique. I kind of hit on that a little bit and it's where we're located. So here's an open picture of our forest fragmentation issues. You can see how barren it kind of is. There's like little spots of green everywhere and the spot uh, on the ridge right up where it's really heavy. Those are, that's the Blue Mountains, which separates district 18 from, or District 17 from District 18. So everything from here down is the William Penn State Forest. 
and it's pretty sparse as far as woodlands go. So you can see in the picture on the left, you can see the urban sprawl of Philadelphia up until 2010. It's obviously massively expanded since then, but it's pushing out further. So like I said earlier, our goal is to you know try to grab as much land as we can to help conserve our forests in the area. So although we do the same management on our state forests as all the other districts, our priorities are much different. So due to the nature of being in the Southeast, uh, our primary concern is invasive species, invasive plants. We have many, many challenges on our tracts of land down here. And most of the tracts of land we acquire have either been cut heavily right before sale or were just poorly managed for years and years. So it presents a unique challenge for us as foresters down here to rehabilitate our forests to a working sustainable forest by managing the invasive plant species as well as promoting healthy native regeneration. So some tracks take years and years to see a noticeable difference. And we also have the challenge of being fragmented due to the urban sprawl. Nothing is close for us. Um, from our central office, say to Goat Hill, it's an hour and 20 minute drive. So it really makes it challenging to make the best use of our time. And as I said earlier, due to the urban sprawl, we focus on conserving as much land as possible with the help from other conservation agencies. And as of right now, we have quite a few other areas of interest that we're looking to acquire to help keep the land intact and prevent further development and fragmentation. And I'd just like to take note of the picture that says invasive plant species. Those are my coworkers, John and Harris. And behind them, which used to house a nice, re nice regrowth of tulip poplar and black birch was overtaken just this year. That is first potentially second year growth of Japanese Aurelia, which is a highly invasive species. Uh, it grows super fast. Both John and Harris are a little over six foot tall in their level. It's not going uphill. That's just how fast Japanese Aurelia grows. And we have been treating that since we picked up that piece of property. So it's been at least a year and a half, two years now. And it's, it's a very difficult battle. And it was cut and high graded before we picked up the property. So we're really, it's really a challenge, but it's our job. And we really like to, you know, try to get the forest back to the way they should be and rehabilitate things. But it just makes our priorities down here than most of the districts you may have heard from. So what do we offer in the William Penn? We offer low density primitive recreation, picnicking, hunting, and fishing. We have no motorized recreation just because our sites are small and also most of them are like mountainsides, so they're pretty steep. Uh, we have hiking, horseback riding, mountain biking, which we'll be more of in the future, and picnicking, hunting, and fishing. Primitive backpack camping is permitted throughout the state forests. A permit is required to stay more than one night at one location, but if you plan on moving your campsite from night to night, we don't really require permits. It's more of just a safety thing. We like to know who's out where in case we get a call. We just want to have record of where people are at. I did mention the primitive campsite on Little Tinicum Island, which is kind of like a travel at your own risk. It's a beautiful spot. I would recommend it, but we always like to promote people who are strong with their boating skills. Um, we have game opportunities, deer, squirrels, rabbits, grouse. So Tinicum Island is really good for waterfowl hunting. Hunting is permitted throughout our state forest, except for our safety zones. Octorero Creek uh, that borders Goat Hill is good for warm water fishing, for bass and panfish, and then of course the Delaware River. And basically, if we only have a little bit of state forest, what are what else do we do in the William Penn? So we have Nine counties, as I discussed earlier, we have three foresters. I got some nice action shots from newspapers. Um, from left to right, we have Harris Nowatarski. He is our forester who covers uh, Lehigh and Bucks County. And then in the middle is John Nissen. John covers Northampton, Burks, Lancaster, and the western half of Chester. And then myself, in the bottom, the uh, two pictures on the right, I cover Philadelphia, Montgomery, Delaware, and the eastern half of Chester. 
So those are our primary jobs, our service foresters. But we also have other different jobs. And because we have less than 3,000 acres of state forest, but such a large coverage area, first and foremost, we are service foresters. So if you're unfamiliar, a service forester is a forester who provides assistance, education, and guidance to residents within their counties. Generally speaking, in most other districts, service foresters uh, would extend to landowners who have some sort of acreage, you know, whether it's two, three, 10, 50, 100 acres of land. But here in the Southeast, we tend to do things a little differently. Um, basically, we provide service to anybody who calls, no matter the size of their property. So for myself, I'm also a service forester, I'm the recreation forester for the district, and I'm also the urban forester. So we all wear many different hats. So I can get calls from a resident in Philadelphia that might have, you know, just a little tiny sliver of a backyard, but they want to know what they can plant native or, you know, I want to plant a tree, but I can't have a big tree. What should I do? I answer those calls too. I don't like to be discriminate, discriminatory. Like if you have, you know, a hundred square feet of property behind your house, you have 60 or hundred acres. Like my job is there to help and to educate. So also my counties are different. I cover the most populated counties. But other than our main job titles, we have secondary jobs. Uh, Harris is our management forester. So he does all the timber sales on our state forest. And he's also our GIS coordinator and our drone operator. We have our own drone and Harris is highly skilled with it. And then John is primarily a service forester, but he does more of our stewardship and management plans for private landowners who work with NRCS, which is the Natural Resources and Conservation Service um, with the USDA. And then with that, we also have two fire foresters, Derek Etter and Zach McNeil, and they split the northern and southern half of our district. So Derek covers the north and Zach covers the south, and they are Predominantly, they manage all aspects of wildfire within the district, and they, they do assist with management on state forests when needed um, or in their slow, their slow times because, you know, we don't have forest fires all year round, wildfires. And they work really closely with uh, volunteer fire companies and all fire companies within the district and our support crews because with having such a small complement uh, with our managers and the two maintenance guys and the seasonals that we have, there's only 11 to 12 people on staff for nine counties and our 2,500 acres. So we kind of all rely on each other to get the work done. And it's really great down here. Uh, a lot of people kind of don't know we exist and we really like to get it out there that, you know, the William Penn is here and we're getting more and more acreage and we're here to help primarily. Uh, John Harris and I, our main part of our job is to answer phone calls and assist landowners and educate landowners. I also tend to be more of a public speaker than those guys. So I teach classes. I teach the Pennsylvania Master Naturalist class, tree tenders. Occasionally, I do presentations like this. I have preschool programs that I help do. I teach high school classes. I work with your sinus university, your sinus college occasionally for an environmental class they have. So my job kind of encompasses everything. And I also do traditional forestry, treat invasive species. I also administer timber sales, but primarily on state parks uh, with my position. Harris does all of our state forest management. And if state parks need something done, I generally handle that. So very different from the rest of the part of the state. I started my career and Clear Creek State Forest, District 8. I then moved to the Loyal Sox State Forest in District 20, which is also where I'm from, from Tioga County. And then moved down here, and this is more of what I like to do. I like to teach, but I also like traditional forestry. So it's a really good mix down here. And the William Penn is a great place and definitely happy that I was able to do this presentation and highlight what we have to offer down here because we're kind of lumped in with the Philadelphia area and which is not a bad thing. It's super great down here, but we exist. We're here. So it's it's really nice to have this opportunity. So with that, um, any questions? 
I'd just like to share if you want more information about the William Penn State Forest, including any of the maps that I have up, if you just search William Penn State Forest, our DC and our website will come up first. We also have a Facebook page, um, William Penn State Forest, to stay up to date on events in the area and in the district. I do, don't post too much on it, uh, but I'm really working on doing it more. I'm not much of a Facebook aficionado. Uh, and then if you're interested in volunteering in the district, predominantly trail work because I'm always looking for people to help me with trail work. If you search DCNR conservation volunteer application, it'll bring right up to the application to fill out to be a volunteer. And if you would like to work strictly in the William Penn State Forest, make sure you select that on the application. So that's what I have. I have no idea what time it is. Might be a little early, but close. I did pretty good. So that's the William Penn. So if anybody has any questions, and if I can't answer the question, there's my information. Feel free to reach out. I always, I will find an answer to something if I can. So I'm here to assist. Thanks, Kayla. That was really, in, really informative. Um, I always enjoy learning more about our state forest districts. Um, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat at this time and I can read them off to, uh, to Kayla. Um, while we wait for some questions, I have one, Kayla. Don't you have a hike coming up next weekend? Yes, thank you for reminding me. Uh, October 2nd is Walk in Penn's Woods Day and I will be leading a hike at our George Birch Tract at our Sportsman Road parking lot right above the Warner's Real Estate Hospital. It's a big stone parking lot on the right. If you go up Sportsman Road, can't miss it. Um, we will be walking up the ridge that was built, the trail was built by the Student Conservation Corps up to the top, which uh, has logging roads. So it's about a mile and a half, two miles. Um, it is not handicap accessible and um, no pets are allowed because the trail going up is relatively narrow because it's cut into a side hill. And we, it is relatively steep, but we'll be ta taking breaks and talking about the area, the tree species. It's kind of an educational walk. If anybody wants to learn more about trees, just wants to be out in the woods for a day, um, the hike starts at nine o'clock at our George W. Works Tract on Sportsman Road, if anybody would like to join. All right. Um, I have a question about your timber harvesting. I know you... <laughs> saying that um, overall the goal of William Penn is land acquisition and um, you know rebuilding the forests that have been you know cut in your district. Um, if you are trying to build up your um, timber population, how much how many timber sales do you like actually have in a year? Oh very few um, maybe one a year and they're very small. Most of our timber harvests that we've been doing are predominantly ash salvage because of the dying emerald ash or the dying white ash. So we're trying to get the white ash out of there because also it's very small areas and they kind of like pose hazards to people who want to recreate. So most of our sales are ash salvages and some of the properties that we have picked up um, are kind of like monocultures so our one spot in our Wurtz complex, we picked up and it was almost entirely black birch, which is good, but we need more diversity. And it's also becoming overrun with invasive species. So we like to control the invasive species, cut out some of the ash that's there, um, kind of reduce the black birch because we want more of the species that were there before, like oak and tulip poplar to come through. Tulip poplar is always our first species that breaks out. They're pioneer species. They like full sunlight. They grow really fast. And once those tulip poplar get established, then, you know, some of the other slower growing species come in. So a lot of our timber sales are salvaged to get out the dying ash and just to kind of clean up the woods a little bit that, that we do acquire. Uh, so really, it's not, it's, it's pretty different from the northern districts. We're just trying to rehabilitate and create more diversity within our forests down here because of the high grading and because of the invasive species pressure, which can be contradictory because if you open up a, a stand of timber, you tend to get more invasive species. 
but without cleaning things up, it's really difficult to rehabilitate our forests down here. So uh, I think the last few years we've had more timber sales than we ever had before, but we've also acquired more land that's needed cleaned up and rehabilitated. So uh, we had a question in the chat uh, in relation to your hike. Um, they were wondering if the forest district does hikes often and how they would be able to find out where those are being offered at. We usually don't do any hikes. This is the special walk in Penn's Woods across the whole state. Um, if it's something that we would, that people are being more interested in, um, it's kind of really hard to gauge because, you know, like I said earlier, a lot of people don't quite know we exist. But the best thing to do would be to call the office and ask and kind of like, so we can kind of garner like how many people would be interested in it. would be something that maybe we could do like once every couple months in, cause we also, how I also have many other responsibilities too. So, you know, it's hard. We like to, if we're gonna do, you know, guided hikes and things like that, it has to kind of be worth the time. Like, you know, not saying that nobody is, it's not worth anybody's time. I didn't mean it like that, but you know, we just want to have, you know, the bang for the buck. We want to have a lot of people and get the word out faster and things. But we are starting to put those ideas out there now that the district is rapidly growing like it is. So uh, calling the office or even getting on the Facebook page and just, you know, dropping a message. I manage the Facebook page. Um, you know, it's something that if I get enough interest in it, since I'm the recreation forester, it's definitely something I can do, you know, at least a season, one a season, spring, summer, fall, winter, until we get more people that would be interested in doing it. Because our, our staff is so small. That's what makes it really difficult. A lot of the other bigger districts have educate, like environmental educators and things like that. And we're just really small. So we're working on it. We're definitely expanding. It's just time and staffing. So, which I'm sure most people can relate to these days. Definitely. Um, we don't have any more questions in the chat. So, I mean, if anyone has anything else that they would like to ask before our time here is done today, uh, we did get a note in the chat that says, thank you for protecting our drinking water um, because we need our forested lands. Um, and otherwise, we are all set. Thank you again, Kayla, so much for coming out and speaking with us today and telling us more about William Penn State Forest. Um, this presentation was recorded, so I'll make sure to share it out with everyone who registered. I know uh, quite, it's, it's tough to take an hour away from your day in the middle of the workday, so um, we'll make sure to, to have, have this shared out with everyone who registered. And it will also be up on our YouTube page along with all of the rest of our Get to Know Your Forest webinars that have been done in the past. So with that being said, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, make sure to take some time to get out and enjoy our state parks and forest lands. Um, this is uh, National Trails Month this month. So uh, just a nice little plug for our public lands. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, thank you for having me.